There really isn't another handheld PC on the market like the Legion Go as it's screaming over my shoulder because it's doing one of its 30 mandatory updates when you're getting up and running. At its core, this has the processing power of the Z1 Extreme chip inside the ROG Ally, which is the most powerful sub $1,000 handheld gaming device on the market. However, this has a little trick up its sleeve, a little party trick that it has removable, we're not gonna call them Joy-Cons, this marketing gimmick name, detachable controllers, which are cool for a couple of reasons. One, if you get stick drift with this bad boy, highly unlikely because this uses magnetic Hall Effect thumbstick modules, but if you do, you can replace those individual controllers instead of a $750 tablet. However, without a doubt, the best perk or benefit of this feature is the FPS mode that allows you to use the right controller as a dedicated mouse, which is fantastic for clicking faces, although unfortunately there is a small setback to the comfort or ergonomics because of that FPS mode. We'll touch on that later. But to not waste your time, if you are looking for a big screen device, uh, you can't get any more mammoth gargantuan than this sucker. And I know you want to know all the intricacies about that, the resolution cap and the frame rate and the peak brightness and how many touch points does it have? 10, by the way, <laughs> more than any of its competitors. There's an entire screen section, also speakers, thumbsticks, IO, warranty, all that fun stuff. This video is going to be rather long, but it is timestamped with chapters in the description, as well as the timeline of the video, so feel free to jump around if you're athletic enough for it. But if not, sit your big ass down, hang out with me for the entire video, and especially if you are serious about picking up one of these $750 handhelds, because I have a lot of information about it. Let's get it. A little disclaimer for my audience, the Stallions and Stallionettes, this device was not sent for review. I purchased it with my hard-earned money. It took about four days to get to my doorstep from ordering to delivery, which is really fast. So there's virtually no wait time for these devices as of current, which is great because when these new handhelds come out, a lot of times there's so much hype and anticipation around them. The bots and scripts of scalpers get involved, but luckily you can pick up one of these things, no problemo. I've also owned the flagship Steam Deck since pretty much launch. I've also had my hands on three or four different models of A and Neos, the GPD Win 3, the One X Player One S, and I also own a PlayStation Portal, ROG Ally, a slew of retro handhelds, and will be having a Logitech G Cloud delivered in the next couple days. Why I tell you this is just so you understand my background, that I own a lot of handhelds, and also that I love handheld gaming. It is probably one of my favorite types of gaming. And the weird thing is, I have like a 77-inch OLED TV right in my living room with three consoles attached to it, and a lot of times, I'll just throw on some Netflix or something and then grab a handheld. I know it's double screen stimulation, so you're not fully focusing on the show you're watching or the game you're playing, but call it middle age, ADD, whatever you want. Sometimes I want that double layer stimulation and not to mention just having any game you want pretty much in your hands is insane. And I will say 2022 to 23, an absolute heyday for handheld PCs, not so much handheld consoles. The Switch OLED was a little bit of a disappointment. The screen's great, but we were expecting like a Switch 2 or Super Switch or Switch Pro. But things like the Steam Deck OLED and the ROG Ally and the Lenovo Legion Go have all dropped back to back to back and they're hot fire. And if you're on a smaller budget and just want to be limited to PlayStation 5 games, the PlayStation Portal is also a uh, decent existing option for remote play. So I'm not bouncing all over the road, swerving all nilly willy, creating skid marks, not in my pants, but on the road. I do have some notes here. I don't script any of my videos. I just hit, hit record and start jaw jacking and lip smacking, but I have written down several categories that we're going to cover in this video. So let's keep it moving. As for the packaging included accessories, accessories on the Lenovo Legion Go, and don't you dare go anywhere because this thing's pretty sweet. This is on another level when it comes to packaging because it's a hefty boy. You have this outer box, which is slightly soaked because it's Florida, and there's a torrential downpour right now. You thought I was gonna flash you my home address, didn't you? Dox myself. This is the packaging that you would expect from a laptop or a small desktop, a small form factor, not really a handheld. Everything else that I've received, the ROG Ally from Jesus, two Steam Decks from Valve, they're not packaged anything like this. This thing is gonna be safe for its travels, that is for sure. Your system stats are going to be in the top right. This does have the AMD Ryzen Z1 Extreme, so the exact processor that's on board that ROG Ally, which is pretty much the most powerful handheld that you can get on the market. Black Lenovo wafer sticker that needs sliced. <clears throat> Opens up from the top. Probably help if I remove this from the bottom. I'm just a little bit excited. Got ahead of myself. Happens to the best of us. Really like the design here with matte and gloss black clashing on each other. A little bit of Lenovo branding over here. A little red pop on the side like that. So it does look like you have a carrying case, which is sweet. The ROG Ally does not, but the Steam Decks do. Even the entry-level $400 joint does come with a very nice carrying case. God, this is a hefty unit. Looks like some documentation in the bottom. Oh, that's cool. It's like a little, it's like the flooring in the Millennium Falcon used to smuggle cargo. <laughs> trap door down there. I love that for you and, and for me as well. A little hole over here you can slide your finger into. 
I'm gonna assume the charger block is in here, which is no slouch, wattage aplenty. Little QR code at the bottom. I was hoping that would come off in one clean piece. You won't believe what just happened. I'm gonna go ahead and share the story. So I just ran to the door, stubbed my toe three times on the way over there. I didn't even know I had that many toes to stub. And I, I ran over there, but for simply no reason, because I had to give a one-time passcode to the Amazon driver to deliver a, like a high ticket item. Guess what it is? Another handheld to review on the channel. The son of a bee played me for a sucker. I'm sitting over here texting him the six digit code and the Amazon driver just pulls off, drives away. Probably never to be seen ever again with my handheld, but uh, at least it was an Amazon driver that ripped me off and not just some stranger, you know? All right, back to the review. You are gonna have one year of coverage with these bad boys and you can check the status on that, how much longer you have by typing in your serial number at this website. Also a little coupon down there, a little 15% discount. Yeah, one of y'all take that. Interesting, so this end is permanently affixed and does not come attached. 65 watt, that'll pump this thing full of juice. We're gonna be talking about battery life during that section of the review, but this is 10 foot, just rubber, not microfiber or braided, no dust cover on the USB-C end. You do have this little Velcro tie back. Thought it'd be branded with Lenovo across it or something. And this holographic reflective packaging is very reminiscent of the previous handheld PCs that we've reviewed on the channel. I like this a lot, beautiful presentation. Let's bust into this can of biscuits, shall we? <clears throat> nice little pass through right here that is magnetized, a little flap, and that is to pass through your charger so you can actually charge it while it's in this protective case, which I will say provides a good amount of protection. I'm trying to click down the analog sticks, the thumbsticks, and I can't click down L3 and R3. Nice little matte black legion, kind of raised rubber. Very nice. Little grab handle if you want to carry it like a purse, Michael Kors. Then you've got, <coughs> excuse me, then you've got these two metal pull tabs on the side. Interesting little icon or logo on them. Let's get into this thing. Building anticipation for the moment. This is like actually designed directly for this handheld. Flashing red at me probably means low battery. Uh, immediately want to note how mammoth this device is. It is just... It, it is, it's, it's huge. And you might be wondering what this is for. This is so you can use the right grip, the right Joy-Con, we'll call it that for just a moment, to snap onto here and use it as an actual mouse. Very useful for shooters. Little plastic sneeze guard telling you not to shove this into the blowhole of an innocent beluga whale. Fuck me running, that's a big one. Little peely sticker here. Thought that'd make a, more of a noise for you. Jeepers, creepers, wowzers. Just for size comparison, here's a PS Portal. Real quick note, because I didn't know where to throw this in, so I'm gonna sprinkle it in here. You do get three months of Game Pass Ultimate, which is freaking cool, because that is a big library of games. You'll, you'll have games to play with this thing right out of the gate. The Legion Go is an ergonomically very comfortable. In fact, I would rank it at the bottom of the barrel here, with the PlayStation Portal being top of the line, Steam Deck being right below that. Then the ROG Ally takes a little bit of getting used to. This case does help a lot, but it still has that awkward cut in where you have to use kind of a modified grip and a modified grip is exactly what you need with the Legion. However, since there is these rather bulky Joy-Cons, which I'm going to explain in just a moment why I think Lenovo took that route. And it's not necessarily for comfort because that seems like a side point here. It's for the functionality of being able to use the right Joy-Con. I'm going to continue to call them Joy-Cons. The right detachable hand grip as a mouse, which feels fantastic and works very good for first person shooters. But that one side feature that not everyone that picks this device up is going to use is the reason that there's these big bulky hand grips. There's not a very ergonomic cut in. Most likely is because on the right you have the touchpad, which I am glad exists, but then you also have two buttons on the side, which we'll touch on in just a moment. You're able to detach this and use it as a mouse, which is really cool, but that's only going to be utilized for some games by some gamers. Because of that, this has really bulky palm grip. So I found the most comfortable way to hold it is to lay your palm flat on the side and then kind of wrap your index finger around the top. Also, there is a shitload of stickers on here, a cute QR code there, sticker there, a model number here, a skew in the back, a lot of stickers. As for the dimensions and weight, because this is a portable device that we're talking about, although a lot of these handheld PCs, they're portable the same way a Switch is. You're probably going to be throwing it into a backpack, purse, or laptop bag. You're not shoving this up your tuchus or into a cargo pocket. It's been over a decade since we've gotten away from handhelds that are truly pocketable, showing a little B-roll of my wall behind me where I've got some handhelds of yesteryear. And aside from the Sega Game Gear, which is a brick, the brick that knocked out Debo, you look at things like the PSP Go and the Nintendo DS, those bad boys were pocketable as shit. In 2023, we're focusing more on raw horsepower, the, the pinnacle, the peak, the height of performance, but we're sacrificing things like battery life and portability. This device is the least portable of the portable devices as the dimensions are fucking massive, popping up on screen here, and it's also very hefty at 1.41 pounds, 640 grams. That's with the controllers disconnected. You snap them Joy-Cons on, you're at 854 grams, or 
under 1.88 pounds. God damn. In practice, I will say you definitely do feel a lot of that heft, especially if you're holding the unit out in front of you and you don't have your elbows propped up on your desk or pillow or lap or something like that. You're just hovering over out like that. It is a very big device, although I will say the weight is perfectly evenly distributed throughout. And since it's pretty wide, you have a nice stable platform here. And the grips, like I said, it's pretty much the least comfortable of the four handhelds that I'm talking about in this video, but still not uncomfortable by any means because you have these large sculpted palm grips could be even more sculpted and rounded if the right one wasn't a mouse. As far as controls, I am a fan of the thumbsticks, but they do feel very unique. And that is because they are magnetic hall effect thumbstick modules. So they have a different feeling than potentiometer thumbsticks. They are still spring loaded. And these ones actually have such a degree of tension to where it's almost like they want to be in their neutral position and they're constantly pulling your thumb back to that center dead zone. It feels really nice. I just wish they were a little bit taller so you had more range of motion as these are rather short. The biggest issue with the thumbsticks hands down, which I just discovered after playing with it for the last couple days, is the dead zones are bigger than any controller or handheld device I've ever used. And unfortunately, unlike the ROG Ally and Steam Deck, which both have a settings option where you can actually taper back a slider to reduce your dead zones, you do not have this here. So you have these really short thumbsticks that already don't have much range of motion. Plus the first 40 to 50% of input don't do anything. Your guy doesn't even start moving or aiming on screen. So a uh, big old dead zone. And I hope with a future patcher update, there's some kind of a slider to adjust that. I am also a huge fan of the RGB lighting around the outside. The ROG Ally only has three steps of adjustment and in its lowest setting, it's still disorientingly bright in my opinion. These rings on the Lenovo Legion not only can get quite dim, but also they're kind of hiding behind the thumbstick cap. So you only see them from certain angles. And if you have big old thumbs, you're barely going to see them at all. They're a much more tasteful, classy, elegant RGB, if you will. Words that don't usually apply to RGB. Not as flashy and in your face and rambunctious as something like the ROG Ally. The D-pad is my favorite of the bunch out of all four of these devices. It is tight. It is tactile. It is clicky. It is quiet. And I don't really like this gloss or piano black that will collect fingerprints and micro scratches like nobody's business, but it feels good. Also, it's damn near flush. It, it's, it's nice. Face or action buttons, I feel like are extremely cramped and close together, more so than a standard controller. And I also don't really like the cosmetic jewel look of these domed buttons. They just don't cosmetically look very good. And they're also very cramped and close together, which I'm not a huge fan of, but nowhere nearly as offensive as these two side buttons, which I'm constantly accidentally hitting. Luckily, they're not bound to anything by default. These literally exist so you can use the right Joy-Con as a mouse. My golly, these are just, I don't like them. What I do like is the touchpad. I wish it was a little bit bigger as you do have a little extra space here, but this is fantastic to have. Not only for navigating windows, but primarily for games like RTS, strategy games where you're moving around troops. Yeah, this is great. I do wish there was one on the left side because sometimes I do go dual touchpad on the Steam Deck. And also this is quite a bit smaller than the Steam Deck and it does not click down, which is a feature that I use pretty frequently to select or click on things. Not to mention this thing is just a little bit smaller than I'd like, but to give it a little bit of praise, it is very responsive and probably one of the best ways to navigate windows from this little handheld device. The other way that I strongly recommend is going to be the touchscreen, which does have 10 contact points, something that uh, I would never use. Why, why I gotta have all 10 fingers on the screen, but I will say it is incredibly responsive and I had no issues with the touchscreen. And then these two buttons, which virtually all of these handhelds have, not so much the portal because that runs directly off the PS5, but all of these handheld PCs have these two buttons. One of them is going to be a software shortcut and one of them is going to be a hardware shortcut. And that's gonna allow you to quickly adjust things like your brightness, turn on and off features like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, airplane mode, and also tweak with your performance settings, adding on-screen overlays so you can monitor things like frames per second. But I really do hate these buttons. I genuinely despise them because you pretty much have to dislocate your thumb in order to reach them. I mean, it's uncomfortable to hit. That is such a bigger issue than the guy unboxing this thing is letting on to because he hasn't had as many hours as I have gaming with this sucker. Oh my God, this is so inconvenient because the buttons that you think would be pause and select, uh, no, this is gonna be your system shortcut buttons, which on the ROG Ally and Steam Deck are in a really good, easy to reach place. Steam Deck, they're down here, but still pretty easy to hit. These bad boys, you gotta dislocate your thumb to reach these. And this is your pause and select for in game. This is a horrendous design for these two accessory buttons. There's no, th no. No. As for the I.O., or as I like to call it, ports, plugs, and slots, you do have your two top firing stereo speakers. We'll touch on that during the audio section of the video. You do have a micro SD card reader. There's no specifications for read and write speeds, limitations, or classifications on their website, but I'll dig that up separately and pop it up on screen. That micro SD card reader is limited to a maximum of two terabytes. That's the max capacity, but that's pretty hefty. But along the lines of storage, I cannot recommend enough spending an additional $50 to double the storage. For God's sake, you're already spending $700 
dollars on this thing i feel like you're gonna have buyer's remorse if you don't pop for the double storage model because yes you can expand with a micro sd card slot and that's going to be good for a lot of your indie titles and whatnot but your triple a games i definitely recommend putting on the ssd which is an m.2 2242 size gen 4 to the right of that you have what's called the thermal fin which is basically for heat dissipation think of it like a heat sink the the, the fans shitting air out of the top i could have explained that better now you see according to my calculations it's going to be intaking with fan in the back and then it's going to be uh, reciprocating that through the body and the chassis and then it's going to eject or exhaust that and vent it through the top Perfect. Then you got your volume controls up and down. It'd be kind of cool if there was a mute or if you could hold down the down button and it would mute that son of a bitch. Then you have two USB-C ports, one on the top, one on the bottom, which I really like. I think it adds versatility to how do I want to charge this. And when you dock it, it's usually just going to be one USB-C cable into the top, which also supports PDP pass through for charging as well. At least any good reputable dock is going to do that for you. So you don't need two on the top. Those are going to be USB-C 4.0 Johns, and those are going to support DisplayPort 1.0 and power delivery 3.0. A lot of numbers because it's a computer and everything's got tech specs. It's going to be a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which if you're using a proper three or four pole, will get you not only a headphone, but a mic combo. So you can mic up with your boys. Then you have the power button, which also has LED RGB glow around it. You cannot change the color of this manually, but it will change with the status of the device. Then you do have two microphones, which is fun. Double the flavor of your voice. And then on the bottom of the right Joy-Con, you have the FPS mode toggle or switch. And right next to that, you will see a little window and that is for your mouse sensor although i couldn't find any information about the dpi cpi dots per inch you know mouse shit. Also, I really wish there was a fingerprint reader like the ROG Ally that makes logging in and out much quicker. Although you don't have that, it's just a power button. It's breakfast. These bumpers, I absolutely hate. Same thing with the triggers. Not only do the plastics feel incredibly cheap. Oop, okay, they wanted me to engage sticky keys. No, thank you. By squeezing the trigger, apparently. Hello? No, no, I don't want sticky keys. Get out of here. I'm ruining my review. Mm, I do like this when you hold down the power button instead of forcing an aggressive shutdown. It allows you to swipe down and then does a soft, proper shutdown instead of devices like both of these bad boys, the Ally and the Steam Deck, if you hold down that power button, it literally just shuts them down, which I feel like isn't the best for them. And then what you're all probably hanging out for, how the hell do you detach these side grips? I'm going to continue to call them Joy-Cons because I keep forgetting the actual name. It's not too difficult. You have a release button on each side. And once you press it down, you can pull these down. I thought they would just pop off in any direction, like magnetized or something. They're not that slick, not that cool. They have to be dropped into this little plastic trough. And then you're going to have these five pogo pins that make connection with these five metal pads in there to get all your connectivity and all that sweet, sweet. I kind of just thought these would snap on a little bit slicker than that, but whatever. You got to hold down the button, pull them down, slick. Ugh. And then in the back, you are going to have a full-size kickstand, which I love. Another QR code and another sticker under there and another one. I told you, this thing's slathered with them. This kickstand actually does feel pretty damn nice, though. I just wish I had a rubberized strip here. I guess you could add that. Boom. Set it up like a tablet. Boom. Boom. Uh, even more controls over here. And something that just needs mention is that the rear buttons do not match up. You have, like, usable, traditional Steam Deck or Pro Controller rear buttons over here. And then on this bad boy, because they are really trying to push that side feature that you can use this like a mouse. You now have to sacrifice proper rear buttons. It could have been substantially smaller with a more aggressive cut in, rounded in, more ergonomic sculpted shape, but because of the internals, the guts here having to be a mouse, this is what we're left with, which isn't terrible by any means, but again, it's at the bottom of the barrel with this group here. The reason I say that comes down to three factors. One, it isn't very ergonomically comfortable to hold because the right joystick is going to be poking into your palm, and I guess you can pinch and remove that. Also, the controller has your wrist cocked at a really weird angle that just isn't comfortable in my personal opinion. And the last reason is going to be the stock skates aren't fantastic. They glide across my mouse pad, I, but they don't necessarily have the best of speed or control. So I do think FPS mode would be more enjoyable if you could pop off that right analog stick, at least without feeling like you're going to break the sucker so it's not poking into your palm. And it was more upright, like a joystick, instead of cocked at an angle, and the stock skates were a little bit better. Build quality wise, the plastics do feel incredibly cheap. There is a little bit of stippling on here, which will give you a, a Scotia grip, but there's still pretty slick. For disassembly purpose, you do have four Phillips head screws, which are sunken in incredibly deep, but if you get a skinny little shaft screwdriver in there, and then on the bottom of the right, you are going to have a sensor, as this can be used as a mouse. It comes with an attachment in the box, and then you have this off and FPS mode. So I have an entire dedicated video ranting and raving about the rear buttons of the Steam Deck, how they make me moist, and this just doesn't drench me the same way, which is awkward because the ones on the left grip are almost identical to the Steam Deck rear buttons, but then it's not symmetrical, and the reason for that being is the 
right Joy-Con is expected to be popped into FPS mode where you're using it as a mouse, and in that aspect or regard, it is designed very well because these two M1 and 2 buttons become your left and right mouse click, although other reviewers are reporting that M2 over here is getting stuck in on a lot of units, so keep a little screwdriver on deck to pry that bitch out. Keep in mind these are early units, and I'm sure with future batches there will be revisions to the quality control, the components on board, and that won't be an issue down the road. But because this is meant to be used in FPS mode, you have these two buttons on the side, please autofocus for me, and then these two rear buttons, and then this scroll wheel, which sure enough is going to act like a scroll wheel on a mouse. Here's my whole shtick on it. You can use this as a mouse, and it is better for first-person shooters than using the trackpad or analog sticks, but there is a learning curve because it is a vertical mouse, and it doesn't seem as responsive and just as snappy as using a native mouse, which you still can use by using a dock through one of these USB-C ports. So it almost seems like the entire feature, uh, the shtick of this having FPS mode, could have been left out, which would have given this tablet, this handheld device, better ergonomics because it could have had smaller, more sculpted controllers. But because Lenovo really wanted to be the only handheld PC to offer this, it's almost like that Jurassic Park quote. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And that really is my opinion here because you get a more ergonomic, comfortable design with this handheld. And if you want to use this thing with a mouse, you can still dock the son of a bee and use it with a real full-size mouse that has the sensor and skates that you're used to. And I, for me personally, that seems like a feature I'm not going to use much, but we all have to hold the sucker and we're all getting not the most ideal ergonomics or comfort because of this large right grip. And of course, for symmetry, it has to be identical on this side. Setup is exactly what you've come to expect from a handheld PC about three hours. That doesn't mean you need to be sitting there clicking buttons the whole time, but you need to install updates from three separate pools. You need to go to Windows settings and check for updates where you're probably going to have 30 to 40 security and cumulative updates to do. That'll take a couple hours because most of them require restarts. Then there's device specific updates in the Legion Space application. To get to those, click on settings and it will show you your current version or build here. And if there is a manual update available, also come down here to controller because there is a separate firmware update available. Checking. Nope, we're up to date. Awesome. There's also a very nice built in diagnostic tool for all the buttons, the thumbsticks. So if you're experiencing any drift, again, shouldn't happen because they're Hall Effect sticks. But if you're having any issues, a button's jammed in or something. Also, I like you get a little warning pop up letting you know if you've accidentally clicked the toggle into FPS mode as that's not intended for normal gaming. A couple of quick notes or tips that I don't know where to sprinkle them in the review. So they're going to be falling into this section. In performance, I greatly recommend ticking on Radeon Super Resolution or RSR as you are going to see a strong performance bump in AAA titles. Full fan speed, only utilize that if you're going into custom mode and pushing this thing to 30 watts. Also, there are some pretty major system redundancies. There's three different ways to get into the settings, which is cool and all, but you do, I don't think you really need all those tap points to get into settings. And another funky chicken here is when you click on Android game, all it does is pop open the Microsoft store for the Amazon App Store with 1.8 stars from 684 disgruntled customers. That's supposed to install an Android game launcher or something because it doesn't. But my biggest gripe here is the fact that it says to press this button to open menu. So that button's up here, that physical button. All that does is open or close the application, the Space Station app. It, not close it, it minimizes it to the background, but it sure as hell does not open up this menu that you get when you tap on the button physically. So hopefully that changes to where when you hit the button that's advertised as opening these quick settings, it, it does that. A little bit laggy when you're scrolling through these massive panels. But getting to your games is very easy. Libraries front dead center, tap on that, click on all games. It'll show you what you have installed as well as your launchers. I do wish your launchers were separated from your games. You can't really create folders or anything, but you can add games from a local path, which is pretty cool. But setup pretty much entails doing updates for Windows, installing Legion Space and doing those initial updates, updating the controllers, and then installing your launchers, updating those, and installing all your games. So it's a much more involved process than something like a Switch or even a Steam Deck, which launches into the Steam OS front end, which handles a lot of the updates in one little stream or path of updates. As for the OS UI and UX, I know those are three different things, but they all kind of correlate with each other. It's going to be the user experience, the user interface, and the operating system, basically the software on the sucker. How does it, what are you doing on it? It is a Windows 11 device. However, navigating it isn't a pain in the ass like a lot of other handhelds because you do have a lot of options. You have the touchscreen, you have the touchpad, and then you can also remove the right Joy-Con and use it as a mouse, which is pretty sick. Of course, you can also dock it and use a full-size keyboard, mouse, and monitor as well. Navigating Windows is a little bit daunting if this is your first handheld PC, but as with all the other major handheld PCs, it does launch into a pretty front end called Legion Space. If you just want to use this thing for gaming, it does prompt you to install popular launchers such as GOG, Epic, Steam, Xbox, Game Pass, etc. And it will organize all of your games, and it did curate or pull from all my different launchers 
launchers and libraries. I will say the thumbnails look smaller and lower resolution if they come from Xbox for some reason, and there's no way to manually upload your own thumbnail. I am glad that this exists because it does make navigating the console much easier. Whoops, Daisy just called it a console, but these little handheld PCs, they're going to accidentally get called consoles a lot because they do a lot of console like shit, like what we're talking about right now, Lenovo Legion Space, which is a Steam OS like interface, although it is not nearly as smooth and easy to navigate as Steam OS. Also, I don't like that the, 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 the store is like a, I don't know what the hell it is. It's just pulling from like the store isn't Steam or Epic or anything that I recognize. It's just like, here's some games you can get. And when you click on them, it says redirecting to a third party website. It's almost like a bunch of ad space or something. Keep in mind, you can actually install Steam OS on this handheld, the ROG Ally, the a Neos. So if you want a true Steam Deck like experience on something with more horsepower, sorry for the car reference, I mean more processing power, more graphical grunt, then you can install Steam OS on these bad boys. You don't need a dual boot or anything because it's already launching into Windows. So you're going to be able to play all games, even with their funky anti cheats. You don't have to worry about that Proton compatibility layer like the Steam Deck where you're going from Linux to Windows games. But a big complaint I have is the physical buttons for launching into Legion Space. A lot of times they just don't work. When they do work, they're very snappy and you can pop open the left or right overlay. Left is going to be launching in and out of Legion Space, which just opens or minimizes the application. It keeps it running in the background, but it will put it into focus. And when it works, it works, but a lot of times it doesn't. And then the right is going to be your shortcut for system settings, which I will say is pretty limited. Although in all fairness, it had everything that I wanted to do, such as turning the RGB lights on and off, changing my frame rate, resolution cap, stuff like that. Of course, you can remote play and cloud play with this bad boy. Full support for all that if you wanted to link up to a physical device like your super expensive, big RGB loaded desktop and then play the handheld in bed or something, remoting off that, you, you can do that. You can also cloud play off things like xCloud with this device, but you don't need to because unlike the portal, this isn't a cloud device that has the processing power on board. As for the screen, because I think this is one of the shining stars in this device, honestly, the big screen and the removable Joy-Cons are probably the two aspects that make this a recommended device. And that's only if you want a big screen or you're going to use those removable Joy-Cons. If not, you might want to look at the ROG Ally or Steam Deck OLED. Screen here is unmatched, not only in sheer size at 8.8 inches diagonal, and it's Quad HD, although not the Quad HD you're thinking of, a 1440p, because it's not a typical 6x9 widescreen aspect ratio. It's actually 16x10, which didn't cause any issues for me in gameplay, and I kind of like this because you have three really good scale options, one of which is the native resolution of the Steam Deck at 800p. And keep in mind, this is a handheld PC, even though it has the Z1 Extreme processor, a lot of AAA titles you are going to be tapering back the frame rate and the resolution. And I'm going to be honest with you, I did spend a lot of time in 800p, which is unfortunate because you can stretch all the way up to 1600, but you don't have the power to, to do that. It's great that you have the option to go to a maximum resolution of 1600p and a max refresh of 144 hertz. However, very few titles are going to allow you to do both of those or even one. You're probably going to have to do some tapering back of settings or you're just playing an older title, maybe a 90s or early 2000s shooter. It seemed like it was a real straight shooter. I like the three scale options, max resolution at 1600p, and then you have the two 16 by 10 aspect ratio options, 1200p and 800p. But I do wish there were more steps for the refresh rate, caps at 90 and 120 hertz, as opposed to just 60 and 144. But the physical bezels around the screen are actually very small. Granted, there is also a smaller black bezel that expands onto the screen itself, but overall really tiny bezels around the outside of the screen, which I really did like. It makes the screen look bigger than it already is, which is already huge. If you have a whoops daisy this is coated in Gorilla Glass. Has a peak brightness of 500 nits, although I will say outdoors or under strong artificial light, I wish it got a little bit brighter. And as casually mentioned earlier, this does have 10 point multi-touch. Not to shit on the PlayStation Portal more than I already have, but look, oh, a web browser, which we're going to be using to test out the speakers. We got some bops here. Demonetize this video. Let's get it. Mm. Keep in mind, I'm at work right now. Two things I want to point out right off Jump Street. First of all, the fan noise definitely does drown out the speakers quite a damn bit. This device gets pretty loud, and this is even without maximum fan speed toggled on, which will net you a little bit more performance. And if you're going into custom TDP mode and cranking it all the way up to 30 watts, which gets you past the 25 that you're capped at in performance mode. But this is just in standard fan mode right now, and the fan is equally providing white noise to kind of drown out the electronic dubstep that I'm pumping over here. So that's not really great. Also, there is virtually 
absolutely no bass or low end, which really sucks because you notice that a lot in voices and dialogue. There's no rich, warm, dynamic tone in the voices. It just everyone sounds like they're talking over a CB radio. A little bit better than the PlayStation Portal, but not by much. I would say these speakers are lesser so than the ROG Ally or the Steam Deck. Definitely the Steam Deck OLED, which has also had the speakers revised. But to give it a little bit of praise, you actually do have a pretty good stereo spread or sound stage where you can pinpoint enemies off to the left and right. No verticality up and down on enemies or anything like that. Um, for what it is, a pretty good stereo spread. It just doesn't get freakishly loud, and I wish it had a little bit more low end, a little more bass, which is expected from small drivers like this. But luckily, you can go Bluetooth or use the 3.5 millimeter jack to have a better audio experience. As for Bluetooth and wireless or Wi-Fi card on board, I should say, this does have Bluetooth 5.1. You know what else is good or even more greater is Wi-Fi 6E support, and I will just say right up front from a user experience, I have never had this fast of download speeds. I am downloading 100 gigabyte games lickety split with this thing, overlaying B-roll here of me downloading it almost a gig down via Wi-Fi with this sucker, which I have not experienced on the Steam Deck or the ROG Ally. So really good Wi-Fi card on board. This thing is quick. So that's really beneficial if you're downloading a dickload of games, which when you first get this thing, you're probably going to want to load it with all of your, your games. Also, you have the option to do transfer over network. So it said if I wanted to save some of my data, I could actually just transfer games that are already installed on my ROG Ally. The RGB lights are implemented so much better than the ROG Ally, in my opinion, because instead of three steps, the lowest being 33%, which is still too bright and disorienting, in my opinion, plus the actual RGB rings are really huge on the ROG Ally, which not only creates a rough grind around the outside of the thumbstick gates when you're at full lock, they don't work like anti-friction rings, they're actually really rough, but also they're just too fucking bright. So I always disable them to save a little battery life and my corneas. However, on the Legion Go, it actually looks really tasteful and classy because they're smaller thumbsticks and your thumb almost blocks all the RGB light to where you just get a little bit of subtle glow. Also, you can dim them to a very, very low brightness, but I will say I wish they had more modes or effects. Of course, they can add this with software patches or updates later, but you only have three modes. And there is this weird glitch or thing going on now that wasn't happening until today where it won't save my RGB profile. You have three different slots which you can customize or tweak and then you can swap those in the fly from the quick settings for some reason it has my speed of scrolling through the rgb spectrum to really fast and i always crank it down to the slowest possible fade for a nice smooth transition it's really effing me today it's not saving as for docking and external gpu support you can utilize the usb c port on the top or bottom as they do have display port 1.4 and you'll be able to use a dock that not only gives you pass through charging but also display out and a couple of usb ports if you want to use a mouse keyboard and monitor for some productivity work. I've said this before and I'll say it again. As far as external GPU support, it's not really practical. You're already picking up a $700 handheld device and then you're going to spend over a grand. Well, eh, most of the good ones are over a grand. You can get yourself like the used Razer one from a few years back. I think it's called the Tomahawk Knuckle Duster or something. But that makes the portable device even less portable because you have to be tethered to a full-size graphics card and then you're still seeing all this graphical power on a tiny screen so it's all just wasted and it's never really made sense to me other than content creators, YouTubers, live streamers wanting to show their audience what you can do with the device. Now, as far as performance, it is almost identical to the ROG Ally in my experience, although not right out of the gate as you do have a pretty unsavory experience when you go to launch your first AAA title and it's choppy and stuttery and you're thinking to yourself, oh my god, I know this can perform better than this. Just like the ROG Ally, you have to manually install a driver pack, which isn't really explained from Lenovo at, at, at all. And if you've never owned a handheld PC before and you don't know what the Z1 Extreme processor can can do or what it can perform like, and you just pick this up, you might actually just think that this is the performance of the device. But if you Google Legion Go driver, the first result is going to take you to this page, which I will have linked in the description below. Oh my golly jeepers, since I'm on my desktop here and not the Legion Go, it's not recognizing the device. But when you click on that link, you go to this URL, this website on your Legion Go, it is going to tell you that you have an updated graphics driver available. Go ahead and manually install that. It's very simple, but you do need to be plugged in or add 50% or better battery life, and then it will restart. It takes a few few minutes and then it'll get you up and running and that literally triples your performance. So you need to do this with the ROG Ally and the Legion Go. Well, the Ally, that was like seven months ago. So that might actually be fixed now to where it's just good to go. But once you get this thing up and running, the performance is going to be almost identical to what you're used to on the ROG Ally, which is a very good thing. It has the AMD Ryzen Z1 Extreme chip and you might actually get a little bit more performance out of this device versus the Jesus ROG Ally because you have faster memory here. Same capacity at 16 gigabytes, but you have 75 
500 megahertz of DDR5X RAM as opposed to DDR5 uh, not X rated. So that's sick. So in certain titles where you're very memory bound, it's not really CPU or GPU focused, but it's just loading up your memory, getting bogged down and whatnot. That faster memory will get you a little bit better performance. Did I notice it? Not not really, no. Now, devices like this that have an APU or SOC, I should say, system on a chip and are using integrated graphics also use integrated memory. So they can definitely benefit substantially from having faster or more memory, higher capacity or higher speeds versus just popping in a couple of RAM sticks into your desktop computer, which won't benefit as much from faster RAM because this is sharing memory across all the other components. It's all integrated. So as far as actual performance, I'm going to focus on modern AAA titles and then retro emulation. Let's start with the modern AAA titles. I'm not going to say I was let down. I did expect a little bit more, I guess, because of the faster memory, but really performance is about identical to the ROG Ally. You do have that bigger screen, which is fantastic, although I was never really able to utilize that full 1600p. In fact, unfortunately, even the middle resolution at 1200p wasn't giving me the frame rate that I was craving or desiring. I wasn't at a lock 60 frames per second. So for games like Cyberpunk and Red Dead Redemption 2, I did taper back to 800p, the resolution of the Steam Deck, which still looks very good on this larger display. But here's the thing that I can definitely attest to as somebody that had the ROG Ally and was a little bit let down by the performance right out of the gate. Updates and patches start rolling out and the performance gets steadily better over time. It's like linearly getting better and the ROG Ally is at a point now to where that is like my go-to when I'm going to play a AAA title that I know is going to be very resource intensive. I don't go for the Steam Deck because it's going to be stuttering and sputtering. Granted, it's more comfortable and has that killer OLED screen now, but I'm sure Lenovo is going to button down the performance of this thing. It's only been out for about a month. I mean, just hardware wise, we have to look at it. It has the exact same processor as a ROG Ally, but with faster memory. Performance, once the software catches up, is going to be really good. And as far as retro emulation, I'm just going to skim over this because I think this device is straight up overkill for retro emulation. A $400 entry level Steam Deck, yeah, that, that's that's cool and all, but a $750 Z1 Extreme processor equipped handheld like this is just more than you need. More expensive, less battery life, hotter and louder. It's more system than you need for retro emulation, but with this device, you're going to be able to run freaking everything. Everything, everything. Definitely all the older stuff, NES and Game Boy. You can all just run that through a pretty front end like RetroArch. But as far as installing individual emulators such as Dolphin for Wii, yeah, it's all going to run really good on this thing. For me personally, it just doesn't make sense considering if you're just trying to do retro emulation, you're better off getting yourself a jailbroken Vita off eBay for like 200 bucks. But if you're just trying to do retro emulation, there's smaller, quieter, cheaper, more comfortable to hold devices like the Steam Deck or a jailbroken Vita that will do that retro emulation for you. As for power modes, TDP limits, and performance profiles, you do have three onboard profiles. I really do despise the fact that it's broken into two separate categories. You have thermal mode, TDP, and then your OS power mode, which can be a little bit confusing. And I really wish there was a way to link them up. And you also have a full fan speed toggle, which I wouldn't really recommend turning on unless you are going to go into custom mode and crank the slider all the way to the right to 30 watts, which is the maximum TDP, which I will say the device gets a little bit warm to the touch. It's not going to scald your fingertips off or anything, but it is a little warm to the touch. And there's probably Probably a reason that the maximum TDP when you're in performance mode is 25 watts, not 30. That seems like a good sweet spot for now until Lenovo can get some better fan curves installed on this thing. To my knowledge, you cannot create custom fan curves on this device, which you can on the ROG Ally. But if you want to get the maximum performance out of this device, you're going to toggle full fan speed on and go to custom, crank it up to 30 watts. And obviously plugging in is going to give you a performance boost of about 10 to 15 percent as it is a Windows portable device. Same thing with laptops. Actually, gaming laptops usually get like a 30 percent performance boost from being plugged in. But for me personally, 90 percent of the time when I'm playing on this device, I'm in performance performance with the full fan speed mode off because it gets really loud with it on. The Legion Go has a 49.2 watt hour battery, which is around 23 percent larger than the Ally's 40 watt hour battery. However, since there is a larger display that does kind of counteract the battery life and with these handheld PCs, battery life is pretty atrocious. However, you can fine tune your experience by capping the resolution, frame rate, brightness, speaker volume. All that means to say you can get anywhere from an hour and a half to six hours of battery life from this device. But generally, if you're playing AAA titles, you're probably getting about two hours. And if you're playing some older games, probably about five hours. As for the included 65 watt charger, which I will say the brick is physically smaller than the Steam Deck and the Asus ROG, which is pretty sick. It does get warm to the touch, but that's expected because it's charging at 65 watts. And it does have support for super rapid charge too, which will allow the battery to recharge up to 70% in just half hour. How the shit do I activate that?
that because it seems like this thing is trickle charging over here. I'm using the included charger plugged directly into the wall, not any kind of a surge protector or socket extension or anything like that. And this thing seems to be trickling, increasing the battery life very slowly. So thus far, my charge times have been really, really slow. I don't know what's going on with that. I'll be keeping an eye on that in case I have a faulty unit or I'm doing something silly or I need an update, but goddamn charge times are hella slow here. I found this dank little article, which may or may not be linked in the description below. Depends on if my dementia is working overtime today, but 10 minute charge is going to get you from zero to 30% capacity. Now I haven't experienced that yet. I mean, it, it's charging right next to me over here, but I don't think it's going that fast. I'll tell you a uh, half hour should get you from zero to 70 and 80 minutes, a full charge from dead, which you shouldn't let your handheld PC completely die in your hand. Now, my whole thing on battery life, these portable and handheld devices, I primarily play them in my house where I'm always going to be around a charger or if I'm on the go, I'm always going to have a charger on me and probably be near a socket I can slide myself into. So the whole battery life thing isn't that big of a deal, although I do fully get the argument that if these are portable devices, you kind of want it more like a switch where you can just have a bunch of standby time, turn it off, throw it in a drawer, pick it up. It's still got 10 hours of solid gameplay on it. It doesn't work like that with handheld PCs. You are holding literally laptop components shoved into a tiny small form factor PC. Some sacrifices are going to have to be made and battery life seems to be the main one. So as for the cons, pros and verdict as I wet my whistle, wet my never mind. There's no water in this fucking thing. As for the cons, pros and verdict as I have the fingers of judgment prepared because I think this device does a lot right and uh, there's some shortcomings as well. First of all, we'll start with the con shortcomings or limitations. The biggest one here is going to be the ergonomics. This isn't a very comfortable handheld device in comparison to all the competition. And in my opinion, the sole reason for that is the fact that the right Joy-Con can be detached and used as a mouse in FPS mode, which is really cool. But if you're not going to use it for that very often or at all, then it's just a gimmicky feature and we all have to hold this son of a bitch. And the grips, if you just look at this thing compared to the Steam Deck, which has smaller but also more sculpted, rounded, ergonomic haunches or palm grips. As we're on the Legion Go, it's a lot more blocky and not rounded off. Battery life is pretty goddamn garbage. We expected this because it has a massive screen. However, since this is a big device bigger than all the other handheld PCs I've tested, I expected the battery life could have been better by putting in a larger milliamp hour battery. But um, yeah, the next con is going to be the Legion space application. Just not a huge fan of it. I don't like the user interface. I'm glad it exists, but it is my least favorite front end of all the pretty front ends. I'm also not a fan of the face buttons. They are very close and cramped together. Also, just don't have the best feeling on the fingertips. Not a very satisfying click. The thumbsticks feel good. I just wish they had more travel. So the stem or shaft was a little bit longer. Yes, you can pop on some kind of a control freak. Well, not control freaks because they don't have compatibility for this, but some universal slipover joints that will add height and grip, which you shooter players are probably going to want to do. Speaking of shooter players, I'm sorry that these rear buttons exist for you because they're hot, sticky garbage. As somebody that reviews premium pro and custom controllers that have rear buttons and back paddles on them, I I've experienced them all. These are fucking horrible, terrible. And that is, again, another shortcoming because this has the FPS mode. However, I will say Lenovo has the option, since these are removable, of coming out with different versions of these Joy-Cons, where maybe they could have symmetrical rear buttons that are the same on both sides. But if you wanted to go FPS mode, you could just use the stock right one that came in the box. The next con, this device is quite loud. The fans spool up and get really loud. And that's even when you don't have maximum fan ticked on with that slider. So a very loud device. And along those lines, the speakers are pretty lackluster too. So you're going to be relying on those to drown out the sound of the fan if you're not using a headset and they don't do a very good job. On to the pros. This has magnetic Hall Effect thumbsticks that should never get stick drift for you. But if they do, because you can get stick drift with Hall Effect thumbstick modules because they have what's called the recentering spring. It's what keeps them spring loaded so they feel like potentiometer thumbsticks. Uh, if you do get stick drift, you can replace these Joy-Cons. That's pretty sick. Price of the individual controllers popping up on screen. I also really like the way the RGB rings around the thumbsticks were implemented. They feel nice. They work as an anti-friction ring when you're at full lock at the outside of the thumbstick gates. They also look good, although I did have that little issue where it's not saving my profiles anymore. But previous to that, the last couple days when it was doing what I told it, you could dim it to a very low brightness, which I really appreciate. And also your adjustments happen in real time. So as you're changing the color, you see it reflected immediately. And I will say the colors are very accurate and you can set up exactly your favorite color. The D-pad feels phenomenal. It is tight. It is clicky. It is my favorite of all the handheld PCs currently. I love the fact that you have a USB-C port at the bottom and top that makes charging a real breeze and you can still use a dock plugging it into the top. The screen is an absolute beast with a maximum resolution of 1600p, although you're probably not going to be hitting that in very many titles, but you do have that 16 by 10 aspect ratio, which allows perfect scaling down to 800p or 1200p, which allows you to run the Steam Deck setting, which a lot of games have just a baked in Steam Deck graphic mode, considering that's like a very popular handheld console now. Yep, I called it a console. 
console. I know it's a PC. It's more console-like. You have 10 finger multi-touch support, which I'll never have all 10 of my fingers getting residue on there, but you can do that. It is very responsive when you're just navigating windows. I do wish it got just a little bit brighter, but hey, we're in the pros department now, so let's give it a little bit of praise. The fucker is big at 8.8 .8 inches, the biggest diagonal screen size of any of the handhelds. So if you're going for a big screen, you're compensating for something, you know where to look. Next up, I love the potential power that we have here. You have the Z1 Extreme processor, and you also have faster memory than the Asus ROG, although performance is about the same, if not a little bit less than the Ally right now, just because the optimization with software isn't there yet. Future patches and updates will get it where it needs to be. I also really like the included carrying case. I think it provides good protection, and I also do like the included charger. The brick isn't very big, and it does support 65 watt fast charging. And the biggest pro here, in fact, the biggest selling feature or factor, in my opinion, is the fact that this is like a switch, basically. You can detach both the controllers, set the tablet up with the included kickstand, which is actually very nice. And it is really comfortable doing that. You don't need to do any trickery. You just pop them off and get to gaming, and it feels great. Also, the FPS mode is fucking sick for, well, first person shooters or third person. Any game where aiming is involved, a mouse is definitely going to be a preferred input over a controller or gamepad. I know that's crazy. The controller captain just said such blasphemy, but that FPS mode is absolutely going to give you more control of not only navigating windows, but also clicking on faces. So if you're playing shooters, that's a great option for you. If you don't like that option, you do have a touchpad, which is another pro. I like the touchpad, despite the fact it's a little small and doesn't click in. It's there and I like it. So as for the verdict, where does this slot in the wide, vast world of handheld gaming in 2023? Almost 24. Holy shit, this year just blew by. Well, in the very near future, probably the next couple weeks, I'm going to be releasing a video, the best handheld experience in 2023, where I'm going to be comparing all the popular handhelds on the market, part by part, component by component. So you're going to get your answer there. But to not just keep my thoughts locked up in my noggin, the only two factors that make this a recommend for me is the huge screen. So if you're looking for the biggest screen on a handheld device, this is it. That FPS mode is incredibly unique. It's the only handheld that offers that. So if you're going to be playing first person shooters on the go, this is hand down a maximum recommend. But as far as anything else is concerned, the Steam Deck is still a great overall device. I think it puts a tick in every box and satisfies every category. And if you just want the maximum performance for AAA titles, I would still recommend the ROG Ally despite the fact it has slower memory because the software optimization is better. And that is the only device, the only handheld PC on the market that supports VRR or variable refresh rate, which makes a huge difference when you're playing modern AAA titles as it smooths out the image. So when you have FPS fluctuations, a lot of times you won't even notice it. And the ROG Ally is also smaller, quieter, can draw more power TDP wise, has a fingerprint reader and more comfortable ergonomics. So I feel like unless you need a huge screen on a portable device or you want the detachable Joy-Cons because you want to use the FPS mode or just set it up like a tablet and use the two Joy-Cons in your hands separately, unless you fall into one of those two camps, I do think you would be better off looking at the Steam Deck if you're looking for emulation and lower power work or if you're going for modern AAA titles, the ROG Ally. And if you just want to remote play some PlayStation games for 200 bucks, the portal does exist. I do strongly recommend subscribing for that what is the best handheld gaming experience in 2023 video as I'm going to go much more in depth part by part, component by component, comparing things like the screen, D-pad, battery life, warranty, user interface of all these devices. But as of now, the Legion Go is pretty sick. It will get sicker, more ill, if you will, with future patches and updates. We saw it with the ROG Ally. I, I mean, I even went on record saying, oh, I'm a little bit disappointed with the performance. And then like a month or two later, I'm saying, damn, this thing is so sick. Probably going to be the same case here because it has the same hardware, but with faster memory. It just needs to get the software optimization. If you want to pick up one of these bad boys, they are sold at Best Buy. If you want to take the brick and mortar route, or if you want to get it online, you can buy them from Lenovo directly. That's what I did. It was delivered in about four days and uh, no issues or complaints there. Now it's your turn. Drop in the comment section below your opinion of this device, as well as all handhelds on the market. And I'll see you stallions and stallionettes tomorrow. Peace. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach in a system as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below to get in touch with myself and the 
the stallions and stallionettes of gamer heaven, join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where I go live every other leap year on a blue moon. If it falls into an odd calendar number and my pH balance is on point. Just kidding. Starting June, I'm going to be live streaming a lot. Thanks for watching. This has been AK40 Kevin hosting gamer heaven, and I'll see you tomorrow because I upload daily all the time, 60% of the time, sometimes most of the time. Peace.